don't call me Jiggy when I'm home, they call me Snowman. We ain't never home, but treat the city like the base, yeah. You know where to look if you're looking for the wave, yeah. Looking for the. What it do? What's going down? What's happening? Welcome to another episode of the Euro Stepping Podcast. Snowman, what is looking like over there, man? Because over here, it don't look too pretty. It's a lot of <laughs> snow outside. You know what, man? The rain came and cleared up the snow. We good. <laughs> <laughs> we good. Hey, man, I'm not going to lie to you, man. I do rather the rain than the snow. After all that clowning about me in Seattle in this rain, now all of a sudden you mess with it. I hear you. I hear you. For the last four days, yes, I do mess with the rain because it's so <laughs> got me up under. <laughs> got you. But hey, man, like I said, we got another good one today, man. A guy I would say is a European vet, played a little bit of everywhere, even over in Asia. You know, played a lot of years in Asia, so maybe we could get a better perspective of what goes on on that side of the world. He's been a McDonald's All-American, a second team parade All-American. ACC All Freshman Team, third team All ACC, an NCAA champion, NBA D League All Star, a French Cup winner, a French Super Cup winner, a Turkish Cup winner, and a two time BJ League champion. I don't know if I should say pause right here because it's the BJ League, but I'm going to say pause anyway. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Jawad Williams. What's up, man? What's Appreciate you all having me. What's up? What's up? Man, how you living, man? You good? I'm good, man. Hey, y'all, y'all complaining about this snow. I've been sitting in this snow since about uh September almost. <laughs> yeah, I'm in I'm in a I'm in a city called Sapporo, Japan. I'm high up north. I'm okay. on the uh, northernmost island of Japan. So it's been snowing here for a minute. Mm. Yeah, you know, but, but you yeah. But you're from Cleveland, so you good, right? Yeah. Man, I'm from Cleveland, but I moved from Cleveland. I don't deal with this no more. Like, <laughs> once I went to North Carolina, I told my parents I was never coming back, and I did. <laughs> I, I live in North Carolina now, where it's, it was 60 some degrees there today. I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. Man, let's jump into it. You, we talked, to, you already mentioned Cleveland, so talk about that. Let's talk about that time, man. You. You, you played with some stars coming up uh, throughout your high school experience. Can you talk a little bit about that? Starting in high school, man, my freshman year, I went to St. Edward High School. Um, it was an all-boy college preparatory high school, which is like in the suburb of Cleveland called Lakewood, um, which was a sacrifice for me because I was coming from the hood. I, lived, I grew up on St. Clair and would have to take an hour and a half bus and train ride to get to school every day. Um, mm. It, yeah, it was it was brutal. I got up every morning at five fifteen, but uh, it paid off in the long run, man. I got over there, uh, had some great teammates and Steve Logan, Sam Clancy, Steve Laporte. Um, I was able to learn as a freshman early, learn the game early. Had a great coach, won a state championship as a freshman, and then uh, never made it back to states after that. But uh, I kept developing as a player. Okay. So you went through that time, and you ended up. Since such you had such a great high school career, you ended up at North Carolina Tar Heels. How was that experience? Yeah, man. In North Carolina. And ended up winning the chip, was, which is not easy. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. My experience at Carolina was great, man. But I always have to tell people like Carolina wasn't my first option. Carolina was actually like my third, fourth option. Um, mm. like my first option was Cincinnati, so I can go play with Steve Logan again. Wow. You know, my point guard when I was a freshman in high school, I wanted him to be my point guard again as a freshman in college. Uh, at the time, they had a 0% graduation rate. <laughs> Parents weren't having that. <laughs> but, you know, those Tell guys. Out. Were... Tell me <laughs> <Tell me. laughs> A what percent? What? No, but I'm going to break it down in defense of them. The reason they had a 0% graduation rate because – the JUCO players didn't count towards the graduation rate. Remember, they had a lot of JUCO guys, like Pete Michael, for example. Yeah, and then the other guys went pro early. Yeah. So their graduation rate didn't reflect the guys that actually finished school. Then can you, can you Marty Lab, all that stuff. So, you know what I'm saying? It looked crazy on paper, 
but you had to let them break it down for you. So in their defense, nah, that's why. We're not going with that. <laughs> we not, we not. You mean to tell me not a single walk on graduated or nothing? Apparently not, man. <laughs> Apparently not. I was like, they must have went on to have some great jobs or something right after, or they got offered something else. But duh, my parents weren't having it, man. But that was my first option. Uh, my second option was Maryland. I actually committed to Maryland and then uh, backed out of my commitment after I went on my visit to Carolina. That visit was uh, it was life changing to me, man. Like, quick story. So I'm getting ready. They send me the itinerary. They send me the address of where to get on a plane. So I'm thinking we going to Hopkins International. It's the main airport in Cleveland. And I realized my mother was like, no, this ain't that airport. This is the other airport. So I'm like, it's only one airport in Cleveland. And we pull up to where the air show used to be. And I'm like, oh, this can't be it. Two dudes ran out, opened up the gate. That was it. They sent the private jet to pick me up. I was like, oh, this is a rat. I know where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> I knew where I was going right there. And I was like, let me just go ahead and play it cool, man. So I jumped on that jet. It was different after that. I still keep in touch with the pilot and everything. So. <laughs> right. So you you go through that experience, you, you you end up picking, well, you end up at North Carolina. We ain't gonna say pick just yet. Uh so you go through that experience, you end up coming out with a national championship, right? Now you're looking at okay, now what am I gonna do? Are you thinking you're getting drafted? What are you thinking? Are you thinking you're going first round, second round? Where's your head at in, at that moment? Man, the entire draft process. First of all, I worked out, I worked out for 16 teams plus the Chicago pre-draft. The entire process, I'm hearing late first, early second. So I'm like, all right, cool. I'm, I'm all right with that, late first, early second. Right. So as the draft starts, I'm like, I ain't, I'm paying attention to my guys, you know, Sean, Mar, Rashad, yeah. and Ray. I'm like, all right, I know they going top 10, whatever. So now we get to around 15. I'm like, I'm starting to pay attention. Get a call from uh, the Grizzlies around 18 or 19. I can't remember. And they decide to, they tell me uh, they can't take me because Hakeem Warwick slipped in the draft, so they got to take him. So I was like, all right, cool. Then here we go, 20, 21, 22, 23. I'm like, man, something ain't right. So I'm falling asleep by the time they hit the second round. My mother like, wake up, they're going to hear your name. At like 32, 30, 32, 35, somewhere in there. I was like, yeah, this ain't it. Something ain't right, man. So my agent hit me like, hey, it's best you not even get drafted. Yeah. Like, at this point, you can pick your own situation. He's like, instead of taking this non-guarantee, you go there and it don't work out. So I was like, whatever. That was the end of that. Like, everybody around me was pissed. Like, family, friends, everybody was pissed. I wasn't even mad, man. I was like, I've been going through this my whole life. I just got to prove myself again. It's nothing new to me. So that's what ended up happening, man. I ended up taking a uh, summer league offer to go to Golden State, which was terrible. It just didn't. It was bad situation. You know, you go to summer league and you got a point guard. We had Monte Ellis, who was a bucket. Ooh. So I want too many balls coming my way. Then I ain't even pause on that. Um, then we go to um, I at a <laughs> like, like six games. I only played one game where I played twenty minutes. You know what I'm saying? I played well. Then I ended up going to training camp with the Spurs. Uh, mm -hmm. All vets. So I'm out there with Tony Parker, Manu, Tim Duncan, Robert Ori. You know what I'm saying? This is right after they won a the championship. Mm. That didn't work out. They sent me to Spain. And then mm. after that, you know, it, it just career started unfolding after that, man. But I just kept my head down and kept grinding the entire time. So Spain was your so Spain was your introduction to Europe. Yeah, man. Yeah, it was. It was an okay. experience. Were you, were you planning on, like, not planning on coming to Europe, but when you heard that you had to go to Europe, how was you feeling? What was your thought process? Were you nervous, anxious? Because I know most most guys... I'm ready to go, man. Like, I know most guys don't know much about Europe, pretty much everybody. I know I didn't come in over the place. No, didn't. So what was you thinking? What was your thought process? I heard so many great things. I didn't really hear all the horror stories. I heard a few, but uh, I don't know y'all remember Shaman Williams played at Carolina. Mm -hmm. He was also in Spain at the time playing for Barcelona. And I was going to be in Madrid. I was in Fon Labrada, which is like 20 minutes outside of Madrid. Yeah. So I was excited to get over there. And then when I got there, man, it was miserable. At first, I say probably two months or so, 
keep it a, keep it a hundred with you. Three weeks straight, I cried almost every night. <laughs> yeah. like, you gotta remember this is yeah. this is before this is before iPhones. This is before yeah. FaceTime. This is before Skype. Yeah. This is before uh, GPS on your phone. All that. Yeah. I got a, a, a flip Nokia with snake on it. That's it. Yeah. Yep. Like, <laughs> yep. So I'm out. Hey. I'm out there struggling. And were you going to internet cafes? Man, yeah. Whenever I can find one. Right. Or you know, you go you go buy the calling card. Yeah, the prepaid you buy a hundred dollar caller yeah. card, but by the time you activate it, you only got 20 minutes left. Like you like <laughs> it was crazy, man. Like I'm telling you, dog, that was that was it was a tough time, man. Like I was like, y'all can have all this money back. I'm getting ready to get on this flight. Like it was plenty of times. I would have drove to the airport if I knew how to get there. Like I just did <laughs> like I said, it wasn't no GPS, you know, it was terrible, man. But um I ended up getting through that because uh, my cousin, who I grew up with, I got him to quit his job and just put him on payroll. I was like, hey, man, how much you make at work? He told me. I was like, all right, I need you to drop everything. You got to come over here. Like, we grew up. We grew up. We lived in the same house growing up. This is like my brother more than my cousin. So I was like, hey, man, drop everything. We could survive the hood. We could do this in Spain. So he get there. He he had a different personality than me. He outgoing. He meeting people and everything. So we good. We just start running the streets and end up surviving. Mm. Spain is not a bad place to run the street, run the streets. <laughs> no, it wasn't at the time. We was out there too. <laughs> we was in the streets. Especially near Madrid. Madrid. Madrid is a beautiful city. Yeah, man. We became we became pretty pretty popular in Madrid, man, because he would go speak to the bouncers and, and meet all the girls and everything. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Your cousin, he, he, he learned his little Spanish, learned how to say my cousin is wide in Spanish. And then after that, it was a wrap. We was, we was in all the clubs and everything. So you so you leave there. Then what? What do you think? You thinking, man, I I, I was I did cool. I, I want to get I want to get to this league. Is that what you're thinking? Or where'd, you, where'd your head at? You think a summer yeah. league? What do you think? I, I knew I was going to summer league. I can't remember who I'll go to summer league with that year. Might have been Charlotte. The Bobcats, which I'm thinking this is about to be love. MJ there. I'm like, you know, it's going to be a Carolina type thing. They end up getting a new head coach. Right. Summer League was trash. Hated it. <laughs> Hated it. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so I ended up after that going to uh, vet camp with the Clippers. Yeah. Uh, I, I played great. Played great at this time. I'm like, oh, this is a done deal. Three o'clock is the deadline. They laying out the jerseys for the final photo shoot. All the other guys who have came to vet camp are gone. They got cut already. Mm. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, don't get your hopes up. My The dude, the equipment guy come out, he laid my jersey. I said, okay, I'm going to get ready to take the pictures for the photo, for photo day. 2.30, dog, get a tap on the shoulder. Coach want to talk to you. I went in there, man, I was, I, I couldn't even be mad. Like, <laughs> it was like, you got anything you want to say after they telling me they about to release me and it wasn't anything I did. You know, they give you just the numbers game and yep. all that shit. Yep. And like, anything you want to say? I was like, nope. He's like, you sure? I was like, no, I'm not. But what, I'm going to argue with you? If I argue with you, you going to give me my job back? And they like, hey, keep, well, uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? After that, keep, straight Keep it real. Life. Keep it real. You cry again? No. Nah, I was, no, nah, <laughs> man. I was no way I was about to cry. I was I was good. I was like, worst case scenario, I'm gonna go get a check somewhere. So I didn't care. Mm -hmm. I already knew what type of bag was being handed out now overseas. So I wasn't worried about it. Especially because they had just had a kid come from Russia who I was kicking his ass every day. And I realized that he was making like three million euros or something in Russia. I was like, oh yeah, they handed out that. I'll go ahead and hop on this plane again and just be miserable. No doubt. Like, it's what it is. Right. But after that, I went to the D League. They told me they was going to call me back up. Never did. That was the D-League All-Star year. And after that, I just kind of washed my hands with the NBA. I was like, I'm done. I don't want to yeah. do it no more. Yeah. So so you washed your hands with it, but you end up somehow making it back. No. It, you'd be surprised what happens when you don't care. Like, and that's exactly what happened. Like, I literally did not care anymore. I came to Cleveland to visit my family. Like I said, I moved to North Carolina. I came to Cleveland to visit. My agent called me like, uh, the Cavs want you to come work out. I was like, all right, man, I ain't, I'm working out anyway. I'm hooping at the wreck with my boys and everything. Let me go down here and get this workout in. So I go down there and work out. It was like three on three. Like, no, it was, 
Yeah, it was three guys. It was six guys total. And I'm like, man, if they view me with these guys, I shouldn't be here. So I leave the workout. Like, literally, right after the workout, I'm gone. They're like, you coming back tomorrow? I was like, no. They're like, oh, you going back to North Carolina? I was like, no, I'm going to be in Cleveland. I'm just not coming back. So they like, they tell my agent, hey, we recording all the workouts on security cameras. I'm like, man, ain't nobody paying attention to us, man. We in there with the with the guy who barely worked. He, he like the video guy down there. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, I'm not coming back to that, man. Yeah. My agent called me. I'm like, no, I'm not going back. He called me again. Why? You got to go down. To, you got to go down there and work out. They keep calling. Tell him I'm not coming. He's like, where you at? Did you leave? I'm like, no, I'm in the hood. I'm at. I'm chilling. On, I'm literally in the hood on Eddie Road, <laughs> right there, St. Clair, chilling. Like, I ain't doing nothing. I've been chilling all day. So the third time they call, I was like, man, let me call you back. So I call my grandmother. I'm like, grandma, the cats keep calling me and begging me to come down there and work out. What you want me to do? She was like, baby, I want you to come home. Done deal. All right, cool. I call my agent back. Tell him I'm on my way. I'm literally, like, I'm coming fresh off the street, walk in the gym, change clothes, have a great workout, uh, play pickup with the team, killing the team. And then uh, that ended up turning into a summer league and turning into vet camp, which turned into a three-year deal. Mm. But I literally was done with it. I kid you not, I was over. Like, I didn't want nothing to do with the NBA. I got tired of getting to that point and getting your heart broke. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like, I don't want to deal with it no more. But it ended up working out. So now you're the – now – you're literally in the league at home at the crib. What's that feel like? Man, it was great. The crazy thing was, man, like nothing changed for me. Like after practice, I would go back to the hood. Like I literally would go back in the hood, be at the rec center every day. And it wasn't like, so I used to, you know, at the time I'm buying all the latest cars and everything. So right. I, I got my dream car. I got with that. I had the first challenger in the city, all that stuff, driving it through the hood. And I'm going to the hood every day, not to show off, but to show the kids, like, yo, I just like y'all. Like, I literally just like y'all. I'm only like a few years removed from being a kid at the rec center every day, or I'm a few years removed from this living situation. So I used to drive my cars down there every day, pick up the kids from the rec center, take them to go get pizza, bring it back, you know, just doing everything I could to show the kids that it was, they can make it. That's all I wanted to do was inspire the next generation, man. And it worked out because we had a lot of guys end up going to the NFL. Um, and, you know, they hit me up and give me my, my, my roses quite often. You know what I'm saying? That was the first person they seen do it. That's dope. Yeah, man. So the time you was in Cleveland, after that, I would say you that's when you really started your European tour, <laughs> per se. Were, yeah, you right. come, were you ready to come back to Europe or by this time did uh, you want to stay in, in the league? Once again, it got to the point where I was tired of the, the league politics and everything behind it. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that was the year of the lockout. The lockout was getting ready to happen. Mm -hmm. So it was like, but in that stint of three years, me signing a multi-year deal with Cleveland, I was released to at least three times. They kept releasing me, bringing me back, releasing me, bringing me back. 10 day, mm. 10 day, release me, bringing me back. Full year, release me, bring, they kept doing it. So I was like, I got over it. So then when the lockout happened, I, I literally came to a, a, a fork in the road. Like, do I want to keep fighting to be the 13th to 15th man on the roster and mm -hmm. might get a chance to play because out of those three years, only one and a half years, I actually got to play. Yeah. Like, do I want to keep fighting for that and make it league minimum? Because league minimum ain't what it, what it is today. Right. Or do I want to go establish myself overseas and prolong my career? So uh, David Noel, my former college teammate, was in Paris. And, you know, all our, all the Carolina guys, we're pretty close. He blowing my phone up. He's like, hey, man, just come to Paris. He's like, where, where else would you rather be? It's Paris. Like, of all places you could be in Europe, it's Paris. Yeah. His wife called my wife. It was a wrap. So I was, I was like, all right, I'm pretty much, I'm over it again. And then uh, ended up signing in Paris. But throughout my career, I kept getting offers to come back to the NBA, but they were not guaranteed. And it didn't make sense financially to uh, mm -hmm. turn down guaranteed money to go take a take a swing in the dark. You know what I'm saying? No doubt. So, so you, you go 
You go Paris, you play Euro Cup. How was that time in Paris? Because I know you went Paris and then you, you kind of moved on. You kind of traveled through a few different spots. But how was that time in Paris? Did you did you kind of was it different than Spain? Was it was it better than Spain? Was it not as what were you at with that? I was a veteran at being overseas at that point. Like okay. by the time I got there, it was nothing that could phase me. I had been through the worst part in Spain. So now it was like drop me off anywhere in the world. I'm good. I figure it mm -hmm. out. So I did when I first got there because I knew Dave made it a lot easier. Um, but I did what I learned to do when I hit any new country. I find a hip hop club. Yeah. You go to the right. hip hop club right. because if they sing in the music, they probably speak English. Yeah. So then you figure it out like that. Like, yo, I'm new here, blah, blah, blah. Can you show me around? And it's a rap from there. So when I hit Paris, it was a rap, man. I three years, it was great. My my uh, wife and daughter, daughter came there. Uh, my daughter went to school in Paris. She went to regular French public school. Mm. And it was right next to the gym. So I had a perfect setup. Does your daughter speak French? Not anymore. She did at the time. Uh, she's 10 now, so she don't speak. She Her, her French is gone. But now she's uh, she speaks Spanish and Japanese now. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's dope. That's dope. So you was in France. That was a little situation over there. <laughs> yeah, man. <It> little. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. We break this down. So, the time I'm in France, I got to give you the backstory first so you understand okay. how all, all this played out. So, the time I'm in France, uh, I'm the highest, two of the, I'm one of the highest paid players in France. The other one is Sean May, who was my teammate. I got him to come play with me in Paris. So, the team made us the two highest play player in all of France. So, bang, that's that. Management changes. They feel like we making too much money because you know, how, I don't know if in France, the budget is for the entire team. That means front office, coach, uh, GM, everybody has split this. So we got a new management team and they like, oh, Sean and Joie getting too much money. We got to go ahead and see how we can get them out of the contract. They even tried to get us to sign French paperwork to get us out of these contracts, saying that our contracts were illegal, which they weren't, they were not. Mm. So all this goes on, Shine gets hurt. He calls our doctor back at UNC, gets permission from the team to go back. Uh, the team told, the French team told him that he had a uh, screw, he had a screw in his foot from a previous break. They told him they just need to remove the screw and he'll be fine. Our doctor at UNC tells us that if Sean removes that screw, his foot is gonna fall apart. Oh. So they never, so he sends me his x-rays. He said, why, what do you see? And I remember clear as day, I see this big bright line going through his foot. He said, yeah, my foot broke and they never told me. So that's, you know, that was like, you know, we all know if you play, you play, y'all played overseas, you know, never trust the team doctors. You know what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, they work for the team. Yeah. So I'm I'm pissed about this. Like now I'm like this this could shine my that's like my brother and y'all trying to play him over some money. Then they say Sean never got clearance to go back to the U.S., which he did. They was like, oh, but he ain't got it on paperwork. So they tried to void his contract. So once like like I told you, we got these contracts. They're trying to get us out of them so they can break this money up amongst themselves. Right. So we end up getting into a now Daniel Ewing. Who was another friend of mine? Yeah, the Ewing, me and the Ewing knew each other since we was 14 years old. I got him to come to Paris. He my teammate. He gets into it with a guy. I break it up initially. They get back in each other's face. Dude fake like he was gonna punch the Ewing. The Ewing punching. Another dude run up behind the Ewing. My instincts kicked in. This is my guy. You know what I'm saying? This is my guy since we were 14 years old. I see somebody run up behind him. Initially, I tried to break it up. I end up getting into a little scuffle with Buddy. Uh, after that, we all get suspended, whatever. Suspension cool, I'm waiting on the suspension to come out. Everybody, so then the suspension comes out, everybody's like three games, two games, five games. The most was seven games, but we're getting time served. My name is Laz, Jawad Williams, three months suspension. <laughs> yeah, they gave me a damn near a jail sentence. <laughs> They gave me three months. Like everybody else got like seven games with time served, meaning they'd be back in a, in a week or so. Right. I got three months. Mine had a time, not games, a time. They gave me three months. So what happened was the French team switched my contract up. 
and said mm-hmm. I had to appear in all these different things. So they suspended me just long enough where I couldn't participate in the in the leaders cup. So they could try to void my contract. So it was it was crazy, man. Like, and then it was crazy in the way that the this one I learned about how the media could put the spin on shit. Mm-hmm. So the whole fight breaks out. Now, one time did they show what led up to me and Buddy getting into the scuffle. They just show me, you know, yoking Buddy up. That's all they show. So I'm like, damn, they put the spin on this shit. They only going to show that part. They ain't going to show what led up to that, whatever. So I contact some people I know, and uh, they put me in touch with a lawyer. They're like, look, take it to court. So I'm like, I ain't even go to bat. I took it to real French court. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. had a few connections. Tony Parker, Boris Dial, they put me on to their lawyer or whatever. We take it to French court. The team thinking I'm about to leave. They don't know I stuck around for another December, January, another two months in Paris the whole time. I would work out like really early in the morning so nobody would see me, go back to my apartment, took on the French court and actually won. Like, mm. won. like got, my, got my contract money, got defamation of character, mm. everything. And then after I won that, um, friend, uh, even FIBA came to my defense and said they overreacted with the suspension because throughout the, the entire trial with the, with the French League and everything, there are seven accounts of what happened. You got the three refs on the court and you got yeah. the five people sitting at the scores table. Yeah. Every account, my name is only mentioned three times. And in those accounts, it is mentioned me as trying to break the fight up initially. It never said anything about what happened after me trying to break the fight up, but they tried to run with it and end up having to pay. And it, it was a wrap for them. And then uh, FIBA took it off my record. All the videos you try to find on YouTube are gone. Mm. Everything completely wiped it away. And uh, they cleared me to go play anywhere in FIBA. And then I ended up in um, Turkey. Man, wow. I ain't going to even lie, man. That, that's a dope boy. You end up uh, beating it, your it game. Beat it was crazy, place. man, but that's just connections, you know what I'm saying? Like, right. being able to have those connections and having somebody fight for you, because the agent I'm dealing with at the time, you know you know how agents work. They don't want to burn bridges, because they just going to send the next player there. Right. So the agent's calling me, like, hey, don't use that lawyer, and he's not going to do this, this, and this. So now I realize that whose team he's on. Yep. My agency ended up firing that lawyer. It, it, it was a lot, though. A lot of people got lost their jobs and everything behind that. Uh that was pretty much the beginning and end of Paris, and they were getting ready to sign a big deal with the uh, Emirates, you know, like PSG, the soccer uh, team. Yeah, yeah. And the face of the team was me and Sean. Our our posters, and they had these big old cutouts of us outside the arena on the actual arena, one of our gyms in uh, in Paris for years, up until it might still be there. I don't know, but like, as I seen <laughs> was like three years ago. Mm. But like we were like the face of the team. And when Emirates got wind of what was happening, they backed out. Do you know how much money was getting ready to be dumped into them? They don't even have a Paris sponsorship anymore. They're just Lavalawa now. Yeah. But yeah, that, that that was a crazy thing, man. But it all worked out. I ended up going to Turkey and immediately getting off the plane and winning the Turkish Cup. That was the first time for, for Kashiaka, that was the first time they had won in a hundred years. That so was it great. all worked out. Bobby, right? Yep. Bobby, uh, Esteban Batista and John Debra. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um the high jumping dude. What's his name? Oh, Kenny Gabriel. Kenny was after me. Kenny, Kenny okay, was the year after, after me. me. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, he came the year after. Yeah. So look, man, we like to ask everybody on the pod a couple of questions. One of them is who's a dude who well, maybe it was just one night or was a few a few times y'all faced each other, but who's the one dude or two? or however many you want to name that just got it going against you and you really couldn't do nothing about it? Man. I know Earl Clark. Mm. Yeah. Man. And I was, that that shit had me so hot. Like, <laughs> he had me so hot because he beat me at my own game. Mm. Fade away. Fade away. Like, bump, fade, fade. Bump, fade. I'm like, Motherfucker, I'm right there. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> and it, that shit had me hot. He had like, you know, he had 17, but you know, 17 in Europe is 
35. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, I knew where the play was coming. I'm like, they about to ice on me again. This nigga is cooking me. And I couldn't do nothing about it. <laughs> After a while, I'm like, fuck it. He should do the next one. He gonna have to get this shit off the line. I just fired the hell out of it. <laughs> right. Was this your Earl? Was that Beshi Tosh? Yeah, man. I was in Gaza Tab, yep. And I had the worst shooting game because he scored on me. I'm coming back like, oh, I hit my first three and then went cold. So I'm like, I was struggling that game and he hitting. I'm like, yeah, I don't like this. That shit had me hot. <laughs> hey, I'm gonna ask you, a, I'm gonna ask you something totally different. I ain't asked nobody this on the pod before. So when I, when I was in Turkey, one of the years I was in Turkey, um, I got, the, I matched up with Iverson, right? Mm-hmm. Now, if, now, you may not have had no experience like this ever. I don't know because you played in the league, so maybe it's different. But for me, when I was matching up with Iverson in my head, I'm thinking, I got to get this game film. I got to kill him, right? <laughs> I was so turned up that I couldn't make nothing. <laughs> yeah. I feel you. I, I've, I've been there. Okay, so that's what I wanted to ask you. Have you ever had one of those moments where it was somebody you just wanted to cook so bad? And who was that dude? And what happened? Uh, shit, that happened to me a lot when I made it to the league. I think one that really stands out that everybody could probably relate to is Kobe. Mm. But like, I sub it before the game. I had never met Kobe a day in my life. I walk out on the court. He out there working out. He getting ready to walk off the court. He like, yo, why? Congratulations. I'm already like, I'm smiling and shit. Like, that nigga Kobe know me. He told me congratulations and I'm like, yeah, I play it cool, though, because he talking to Brian. I play it cool. Like, yo, I appreciate it, blah, blah. He's like, man, keep working, man. And you remember, you ever seen that video where Brian talked about him doing this? Yeah. I, I sub in the game, dog. He did it. Like, he did that shit to me. He did this. I said, oh, no, nah, he got me. No, nah, we ain't doing that today. So I'm like, you know, Mike Brown, they, they, got, they got faith in me. They like, they know why I'm going to fight. At the end of the day, you know why I go fight. Come out, go come out. We know what that means, but tell the people what that means. <laughs> oh, when he, Kobe did this, he was breaking off the triangle. Yes. He was about the ice. Right. So he, that means clear out the whole side and put this whoever guarded him on the ice. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, he did that to me, man. And I get up into him. He, uh, first time he hit me with a jab stick, jab step, jump shot. I'm like, all right, cool. I got him now, I'm on that next time. So then he gets me on the other side of the court, back me down, hit me with a little shimmy fade away. I was like, damn, like I'm right there. Like I'm in his face, ain't nothing you can do about it. As I'm running back down the court, I see my damn sub coming to the table. (laughs) You know that feeling, it's like all eyes on you after somebody that gave you two quick buckets. I see my sub coming to the table and I was like, oh, hell no. I got to get me a bucket on Kobe before I leave. <laughs> but then we go down the court and he switches off on me. He switches off until I think he can put like Lamar Odom on me or something. Mm. I was like, fuck it. I still got to get a bucket. I cut back door. Shaq hit me with a pass. I lay it up and ran straight off the court because I knew I was coming out the game and that was it. I was done for the night. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I had them I had them, uh, I had them. moments a lot when I made it to the league, man. Like I got to play against Dirt. Mello, mm. um, Brandon Roy, yeah. Uh, see Kobe, Ron Artest, D Wade. Like I was, I was that guy. I had to go guard all these guys, and they go stand on, go stand in the corner. Right. You know I mean? <laughs> but the thing was, the great thing was, I had Brian too. So Brian was like, that was my guy. So Brian be like, hey, Wad, you ready? I'm like, yeah. So he used to run an ISO play for me. If I score, they gonna keep coming back to me. But if, if I miss, I might not touch it for seven possessions. So I had to check into the game every time, ready to go. And I would, you know, a couple games I got the cooking. And uh, but yeah, but I had to, I had to line up against a lot of them dudes, man. Like Dirk, like, I had, to, I had to face all them dudes. Let's go. That's tough. All right. So anyway, let's get back to Europe. Let's get back to Europe. You spent. A year and a half, two years in Turkey. How was that Turkish experience for you? Because I know uh, Turkey is a little different than other countries as far as living. For me, I love Turkey, dog. I loved it. I spent, the, I was actually two and a half years. My yeah. half a year was in Kashiaka and then two full years in Gaziantep. I loved it. Like mm-hmm. the people were nice, uh, the food was great. 
I had my family over there with me. Speaking of the food, quick question. I know Guys in Temp is known for the food, right? Mm -hmm. That's great. The baklava, the kebabs, all that. Yeah. Did you have the runs one time at least? What? Yeah, I did. <laughs> Man, you already know those spices over there are different. Yeah. <laughs> it got to the point I knew who it was. So when other Americans used to come over there, I said, I used to tell them, I said, look, food is great, but don't panic. Cause you might have to go to the hospital for the first week. <laughs> and everybody used to think it was a joke, and I used to be like, "Look, you know, these dudes, I don't, I don't drink pop. I only drink water and and Gatorade. Dog, drink this Coke with this this food. Trust me, it's gonna settle your stomach. They drink this Coca Cola. They ain't believe me, and I got dudes. Call, they like we get ready to go to practice. Hey man, tell coach I can't make it today. Like I told you, man. <laughs> Well, guys will tell you to tear me up, but once you get used to it, though, you straight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. After you leave Turkey, you end up going to uh, Greece, to Ike, well-known club around Europe. How was that? Uh, off the court, it was great. On the court, was on the court was solid. I was with Yuri, um, who was my coach in guys and tech for the past year. So me and him had a strong connection. Like I was his guy, you know what I mean? It, mm -hmm. He needed, he always needed a stretch for who was going to defend. So he always made sure I was with him. Um, the problem with Ike was they wasn't paying. Mm. They was not paying dog. They refused to cut a check. Like it was crazy. <laughs> we get there, but you, we reported it. <laughs> dog. <laughs> <laughs> dang, dang. They refuse to cut a check. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, hey, man. That time in Greece was tough. Greece was Ooh. tough. Uh, I mean, I was whenever, whenever my agent came and told me, hey, it's a job in Greece that they're interested in you, I'm like, man, nah, I'm cool. I can't go to, I don't have that. I'm not making, I'm not making a million where I can take that chance. I ain't got that kind of money saved up to take that chance. No, <laughs> and what happened with me was you're a Yuri left halfway through the season in Gazantep, and he couldn't take me with me right away, take me with him right away. So he was like, next season, you're coming. I was like, oh, whatever, I'll think about it, knowing I'm probably going to. So me and my wife and my my, uh, my kids, we get a five-day vacation. I go to Athens. My wife and kids love it. They love yes. it there. They love the food, the, the people. You know, it's warm. It's nice. So then it just literally is like, you want to come here? My wife was like, yeah. All right, cool. I call Yuri, like, Yuri, I'll be here next season. All right, get the done deal. We get the done deal in like May. You know, that's unheard of. Right. right so, right. man, I get there. <laughs> you know, you're supposed to get a check probably like, we get there August, you know, September, October, you're supposed to get your first check. Nah. We get there, we ain't even got our apartments ready. So, all right. Then you find out you got to sign your own lease in Greece. Yeah. Oh yeah! For sign your own lease. So I signed my own lease. Whatever. You gotta uh, find your own place. Yeah, they give you some options, and you just go right. going. So the leasing company hit me up like, "Hey, you gotta pay this deposit." I'm like, "Man, don't don't email me. You better email the team." So the housing money and my contract money was separate. Yeah. yeah. So they wouldn't even they didn't even give me my housing money. So I'm like in this apartment with no housing money. I'm like I'm not spending out my own pocket. I mean, we talking like 3,000 euros right. for yeah. a month. I'm like, no, nah, I ain't doing that. I was like, call them. So the team finally, like a month later, I done been in this apartment for like a month and a half, not paid nobody. So they finally <laughs> cut a check and I paid them. And then we, we playing well, man. We went like 16 games in a row. We lose to Olympiacos. At Olympiacos, the president like, oh, I felt y'all should have won that game. Fine. Nobody's getting paid. Man, I'm like, oh, you got me fucked up. So I've always been the guy who wasn't scared to be the bad guy. You know what I'm saying? Because, I, yeah. you know, it's, it's a lot of guys to be like, man, I'm going to call my agent. I'm like, your agent ain't going to fight for you like you. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, because your agent going to send another player here. So I, w I went in the office, like, look, man, I don't know what y'all used to, but if I don't get my money, I'm out. I'm like, my contract says within 30 days of my due date. If we hit 31... Don't even look for me. I was like, don't even look. I'm talking to the manager like this. He calls yeah. the president. 
I'm like, tell the president what I'm saying. Put me on speakerphone. I don't care who here. You 31 days, don't even look for me. I'm out. So that was the first time it was late. Then they always waited a couple weeks after that. So we get to like, uh, let's see, February or something like that. And y'all know, once you hit January and February, it's all yes. downhill in Europe. Yeah. Now yes. you're you hoping your check hit. Yeah. So like, <laughs> we get to that point. It was around my birthday too, man. We um we had a top eight Perfect. game for Euro Cup or Euro, I think it was Euro Cup to go to. We played game one away in like, where were we at? Bulgaria, some shit like that. Game one was away. Game two is back in Athens. On the way to game two, I realized it's Saturday. I ain't got paid. So I'm like, I'm out. The manager mm-hmm. come to me on the bus said, Jay, I keep getting this call from this Italian guy. He keeps asking me about uh, your passport. What's this all about? I'm like, man, I don't know. I'm playing dumb. Man, I already got some emotion. As soon as we land, I'm out of there. I'm, I'm gone. I signed a new contract. Mm-hmm. You know, said, said that they voided their contract, sent them the paperwork. I was on the new deal on my way to uh, Reggio Emilia in Italy. Mm. <laughs> I like how you move, because a lot of goos, dudes don't move like that. Man, that's the issue, too. That's why these teams do what yeah. they do, because yeah. a lot of guys rely on their agents and don't understand that sometimes the agents and the teams are in bed together, and they're they not working for your, for your, on your behalf. Certainly you know, if you got a European time. agent. Certainly yeah. if you got, yeah. It's, it, it's tricky, man. I think the business is set up a certain way. I think um, a European agent, more often than not, he makes his living on the, with those teams. Right. So he don't want to say nothing that's going to offend them. He's not going to press them about your money. It's your money at the end of the day. So he like, he got his uh, 20%, whatever. So 10, 20%, whatever it is. And he like, I got mine. Like, well, we're going to talk to him. I'm going to talk to the club and see what they say. Like, no, nah, it don't work like that. Like, so that's where players need to learn how to step up and speak for themselves and be willing to be like, look, worst case scenario, dog, you go somewhere else and get another job. Like at the end of the day, I always feel like if I do what's right, it'll come back to me in the long run. I'm not doing nothing wrong. I'm just fulfilling my obligations. I expect the team to do the same. That's all it is. Right. You also happen to be in a privileged position. You're a high level guy. You're playing. You, you you probably got what they call fu money saved up from your years of making money, so you can kind of move a little different. I wouldn't say that, man, because even I mean, it's just a, I just believe in doing what's right. You know what yep. I'm saying? That, that's yep. just that's yep. just only right. Like, you know, at the end of the day, they like I got a family to feed. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to tap into my funds to have to like take care of something that should have been taken care of already. Like, you know, in, in Greece, for example, I don't want to spend 3,000 euros when I got a mortgage at home. No so I'm paying, I'm not doing that. You know what I'm saying? I just believe in doing what's right. Um, I mean, yeah, I saved my money, but <laughs> at the end of the day, I don't want to tap into what I say. That's mm-hmm. not, that's not, my contract doesn't say that. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> no doubt. So you go to Italy. What was that loved like? It. That's a whole new different experience. You hadn't been there yet. Yeah, I, I loved it at first. And then, you know, <laughs> you went into the, the life. The, my my team teammates was cool. Me and the coach didn't, it was, I don't know. They brought me in kind of like, I'm thinking I'm coming in to help them, like save them, because they are playing bad. So I'm like, all right, they want me to come in and be the hired gun. Cool. I get there and they barely playing me. I'm like, man, this shit ain't going to work. You know what I'm saying? Like, they got me playing behind one of the Italian guys. Um, then they bring in another guy they wanted to play the five, and uh, Julian Wright, who ended up being my guy. Uh, they bring him in. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, this ain't gonna work. So then, once again, man, me and my mouth. Sometimes I just, I'm like, I'm, <laughs> I go right at the coach. Like, yo, how you get this job? Like, how you who like, who did you inherit this job from? You know what I'm saying? Yep. You know, I, I rattled some feathers, whatever. They ain't really like it. The team, the GM and everybody was on my side, though. The GM and the president was like, yeah, I don't know why we, he had us go out and spend all this money to bring you here and then not use you. Mm-hmm. So, but other than that, food was amazing. People was amazing. 
I, I can, I love Italy. Um, I wish I got a more of an experience of the Italian league because I knew so many guys that had been there for years. Yep. But it just didn't work out. So you do that and tell me this, at this moment, for whatever reason, you make a, a decision that you're going further east. What made you want to move and leave, take take the move and move, leave Europe and go to Asia? Well, I had been a I had been to Japan before. Okay. My was it my second year out. Yeah, second year out. I had been to Japan already, mm -hmm. and I just knew how it was. I knew the people were respectful. I knew they did great business. After those years of Turkey and and uh, and Greece of money being funny and not showing when you gonna get paid and being paid late, mm -hmm. I was like, I'm, I'm not doing this no more. You know, I thank God that I set a path for myself. And I've been on that path and I'm still on that path. My path was, um, my path is to play in Europe after I left the NBA, play in Europe till 35 and then go back to Japan and retire at 40. I'll mm. be 38. I'll be 38. On the uh, 19th. On the 19th. Yeah. So I'm on path to do exactly what I set my mind to do. And I, you know, I thank God for that because it worked out. Um, but Japan has always been love, man. So I come back to Japan and, it's been love ever since. So I got a question for you. Uh, uh, not many players been over here that's been to Japan. I think you're the first player that played in Japan that we've interviewed. Man, is there any, what's the wildest story or something that you have from Japan? Like we know all kind of crazy stuff that go on in Europe, but what happens in Japan? Uh, what's crazy is there are no wild stories in Japan. Like you don't have these not being paid or wild stuff happening to you from the teams and all that stuff. It just don't happen like that here. They do legit business, dog. Okay. Legit business, about, like literally. What about off the court? Maybe the food, the culture shock. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The food, <laughs> the food. <stuff. laughs> Uh, I'm a, and the crazy thing, I'm allergic to seafood, so I got to be real careful. You know what I'm saying? Everybody come over here. I want to go eat sushi and ramen and all that stuff. I don't really do that because I'm allergic to seafood and it's fish oil and almost everything. But like you see, you it's fear factor sometimes on these meals. <laughs> <laughs> I swear it's fear factor sometimes. Like I'm watching this dude. I don't know if you ever seen it. He like spinning these balls and it's like you see him putting some type of meat in there. So I'm like, damn, what's that? I'm like, that look good. And they threw me with the with the mayonnaise all over it. Then they put the barbecue sauce. In. Come to find out, them damn octopus balls. Like they just, yeah, yeah, that. <laughs> pause again, man. We just said pause a couple of times on this show with the JB Lee. Hey, all kind of balls. Hey, it, I, I, it, no, it it got. It, sometime I'm over there. I'm like, like I said, I'm allergic to seafood. I'm eating with uh, I'm eating like some spinach or something. I'm like, damn, this shit tastes different, but I'm eating it. It ain't really registering to me, like, why this shit tastes different? I get to the <laughs> bottom of the spinach and I see eyes looking at me, dog, like these little bitty fish. Immediately, I'm throwing up everywhere, dog. I'm already allergic to fish, so I ain't got no, no EpiPen with me and nothing. I'm just rolling around on the ground in pain, man. <laughs> so I just gotta be careful what I eat over here. But other than that, man, they, they eat. They got some great food. Like I know y'all know hip to the, the Wagyu steaks and the Kobe steaks and all yeah, that right. type of stuff. Right. They, eat, they eat a ton of fried chicken and fried pork. Um, the, the presentation is just different, you know what I'm saying? But you can go some places here in the city and get like some great fried wings or whatever you want, but you're gonna get a bowl of rice to go with it. But you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so we asked everybody on this, uh, on the pod to come on, man, uh, this question. Your playing days in Europe, name your top five. Not players, like if you had a team, Jawad, this is Jawad Williams' team, what would be your starting five? It could be European, Ooh. Americans. You can be on, you can put yourself on there. What you got for us? Two guard off the top, I'm going Corey Higgins. Mm, Corey He's my Mike. teammate and teammate and guidance. Yeah, yeah. Buddy, a killer. I'm going Corey Higgins at the two. I'm trying to think. Um, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna bring Earl off the bench on this one. He ain't gonna like that. Earl Callaway got to come off the bench on this one. But um, <laughs> my point guard, my point guard, I'm going Tia Dosage. Mm, no. nah. Can't Milos be bad at that. Milos Tia at the point. Corey at the two. At the three. Ooh, Sonny Williams. Sonny, yeah. Sonny Williams was an issue in Europe, dog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was giving me a work mm -hmm. issue. Um, trying to think, the four or five. I'm gonna leave myself off just cause I don't want. I'm trying. I'm gonna get guys they roses while I can. So I'm gonna leave myself off. Let's go to the fives. I'm trying to think, who was a dominant five man since that I seen in Europe? Jan Vesely was up there. Jan Vesely was Fran Vasquez. No, I'm going Luis Scola. I'm going to mm, put Luis Scola really. at the five. I played against Scola and, and He's uh, still Spain. killing. Yeah, I'm going to go Scola at the five. At the four, probably Anthony Randolph. Oof, yeah. That's a squad. Yeah. That's yeah, a squad. Yeah, that's that's a tough. That's a tough team right there. See, a lot of these guys don't get their credit because people just don't see them, but they don't know. Yeah. Anthony Randolph came over to uh, Real Madrid was an issue for everybody. Yeah. It was a matchup yeah. nightmare yeah. for people. He was. He was. All right, man. So, so you you've been playing for years now. Like you said, you're about to turn 38. You, I know you see the end coming. Do you have? What you got going? Like, do you have anything set up? Do you have like, what you thinking? Like, when it's over? So I, I started building. I started building up my investment portfolio. Uh, getting into rental properties for low income housing, uh, especially back in Cleveland. Try to help mm -hmm. out my, my my community that way. Um, I started a children's book series based on the life of my kids because we travel around the world. Uh, I started the Nyla and Nash series, which is my two oldest kids because they've been all around the world, literally. So I wrote Nyla Nash Take Paris, Nyla Nash Take Tokyo. Mm. And then the third one is coming out. I might release it. I was thinking about releasing it on my birthday, but I'm awake, so I'll probably do it like uh, March. Uh, I don't want to say what that was going to be, but I, it's, it's a four book series, uh, for, all four are done. Then I got twins who haven't really been experiencing this traveling yet because of uh, COVID. Right. But I, I, wrote, I wrote a children's rhyming book for them. So I got a... I started that, so you know, getting that income, yep. that uh, that passive income from from the book writing, uh, building my own uh, consulting firm uh, for basketball, basketball consulting. Like we said, I've like we all know, we seen things that guys don't understand when they get to Europe. Yeah, and uh, we could be that. We could be my consulting firm. I'm gonna help guys make that transition. To playing mm -hmm. in whatever country they are because I have those contacts. Right. Yep. So if a guy say, hey, I want to come to Japan. All right, cool. I can, if you need me to, I can come be with you for a week and show you exactly where to eat, uh, who you need to know, all that type of stuff. How you transition into Japanese society, like little things that you might not know. For example, I'm with one of my teammates. He has never been to Japan before. He sticks his chopsticks in his, in his bowl. To them, that's like that means like you're mad, it's a sign of disrespect. It means you're gonna kill somebody. So you're never supposed to stick your chopsticks directly in the bowl. So I'm telling him like, yo, move your chopsticks. And he was like, damn, I was trying to figure out why everybody was looking at me like that. I was like, yeah, it's cause you stuck your chopsticks right in your food. You're not supposed to do that. Lay them to the side or lay them across the bowl. It's mm -hmm. so little things like that, you know? Right. And after seeing so many different situations, I could be that buffer between the player and the team or the agent and the team to make sure everything goes smoothly. You know so what? That's the thing I'm working on. That that's that's incredible, man. I um offline, I probably need to connect you with somebody because we had a really good talk with Keith Langford, and he hit me afterwards. He wants to do something similar, so I probably need to connect you guys, man. So offline, we need to rap about that. Yeah, cool. Right. I know Keith too, so yeah, we we talk about that. See, I didn't know other guys were thinking about that, but like I said, I've been to so many different countries and seen so mm -hmm. many different things that made so many different connections. Mm -hmm. I can be that buffer, you know what I'm saying? Especially between these players and uh, yep. the teams or agents in the teams or however it may be. Like I said, sometimes agents don't want to burn bridges. I can be that guy that steps in and be like, look, 
you need to do this, do right by this player, blah, 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 and, yeah. you know, protect everybody because I have no interest in it. And I also want to build a pipeline for, especially for Japan, to the U.S. Because there's a lot of guys who want to go play in foreign countries, who want to go play, you know, Japanese guys, for example. They want to go play in Australia. They want to go play in the U.S. in the, in the D-League, but they don't have yeah. the connection to make it happen. Right. Yeah. So I can, I can build that pipeline for, for different countries, you know what I mean? Israel, uh, just think about the countries that really have deep connections like Israel, Japan, Turkey, uh, different things like that. So, and I've also been doing uh, some scouting for a few NBA teams and they've been real receptive to my scouting reports and should I even get phone calls now of helping them make decisions when it comes trade time and even on draft day, I'm getting phone calls, mm-hmm. hey, what you think? Would you make this move? And I think uh, a lot of the guys that I deal with on that level, on the NBA level, they respect my honesty because if I, even if I know a guy, I can't lie because I'm putting my, putting my livelihood on the line. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I got to be honest with them and they respect that. All right. Nah, man, that's dope, man. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Heavy. So, man, we appreciate you, man, coming on here, man, giving us your knowledge, your time. The stories that you gave us. Yeah, before we let you go though, before we let you go though, can you tell us one thing? Is there anything, if you could talk to every young dude out there, what would you tell them? Uh, shit. As far as one thing would be, don't be, don't be scared of what's different. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, a lot of guys struggle when they get overseas because they keep comparing it to what's at home. Oh man, if I was at home, I would have did this. You're not yeah. at home anymore. You gotta let all that shit go. Like let that go. Like you're not at oh, if I'm at home, I eat this. Let it go, dog. Figure it out. You know what I'm saying? Don't be, especially with you know this age of technology, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to survive overseas. Yeah, right. that's one thing. Just don't be scared of what's different, man. Get out there and, and figure it out. Go, right. go. Go where the go where the locals go. Like that's where you're gonna have the most fun, dog. When you figure mm-hmm. out where the locals kicking it, that's when you're gonna have the most fun. And that's and that's when these uh countries start to embrace you too. Yeah, you're not living that American standard. You going over there like I'm I'm one of y'all now. So let let's let's see me show me how y'all live and they respect yeah. you. All right. Hey man. So for anybody who wanna connect with you, follow you, how can they catch you on Instagram, Twitter, <laughs> Randall? Uh, my Instagram, Twitter, weak ass clubhouse, all that. <laughs> you find my, it's uh, it's worldwide. W O R L D W A D. Okay. So yeah, if you need me, anybody need me, any young guys need to holler at me or anything, want to connect on anything, I'm an open book, man. I give you all the resources I can, man. Just to make sure you ain't got to go through what I went through. Right. Let's go. Let's go. Again, man, appreciate you giving us your time, coming on the show to give us your knowledge, your experiences. We thank you for, you know. I uh, appreciate y'all having me, man. Thank you. For Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. No, I appreciate big time. You appreciate you, Mark. No problem, man. Thank you for watching another episode of the Euro Stepping Podcast. You can catch us on Next One's YouTube page, or you can also catch us on nextones.com. Also, you can catch us on all audio platforms, including Spotify and Apple Podcasts. That's Euro Stepping Podcast, no G. My we, got all the game. Say we got all the game, but I guess he forgot to say it. But that's cool, though. Check in with us on the next time. <laughs> <laughs> Thought it was a joke, what they still playing games for? Holes in my denim, never holes in my game, no. You won't be just like me, they don't love you the same, no. The series three to nothing and I'm back.